Well, I've known about Burley ever since I was little. Probably. He was always there? It, it was like he was always there. My mom always talked about him. So probably, you know, my earliest memory when I was five, six probably. Because she always talked about her family and always included Burley. We started out financially well off, but uh, depression caught us when I was about in the second grade. Every night we had our family meal together and around the big oak table in the kitchen where everyone sat. He, he loved mashed potatoes. Always would clean up all the mashed potatoes and the steam from hot mashed potatoes. And I can see him sitting at the table now. When they got into trouble in school, he and Ralph would have to go sit by Uncle Donald because Uncle Donald was the one that never got in trouble. And he was like the perfect one. He had the football and came at me head first and, and right his butt and knocked the wind right out of me. <laughs> And then there was the time that she said she remembers that she remembers Grandpa yelling in the morning, where's my car? Because apparently he'd run into the ditch the night before. He had a wave in the front of his hair. And standing in front of the mirror, combing that wave, it had to be just perfect before he walked out to school that morning. <laughs> he and my other brother, Ralph, uh, during the high school years, uh, met two girls from an adjacent town and they were back and forth all the time. Uh, her name was Elva Murray. Um, they used to call her Chucky and on the side of the pictures of the planes is Chucky. Yeah, and we always call her Chucky, yeah. <laughs> The greatest double cross in history. Jap envoys talk peace in Washington. Jap planes without warning bring war to America. Our great Pacific outpost in the Hawaiian Islands is ruthlessly bombed as Japan's perfidious declaration of war. Death and destruction unleashed on a nation at peace. But overnight, this nation was united in an all-out determination to avenge the hideous assault on American lives and property. When the news came Friday over the radio, we knew that was going to be life-changing because we knew that our brothers would be involved. Don, the oldest brother, volunteered and uh, went into the U.S. Army Air Force. Um, the middle brother, Ralph, wanted to get in, but because his eyesight wasn't as good, he wasn't allowed to, and so he, he um, enlisted in a, another civil service. And the youngest brother, Burley, um, wanted to be in, and he always wanted to be an Air Force pilot. From the day after Pearl Harbor, you know, I thought about nothing except getting what he had to have to get into the air, the air corps at that time. And he was the only one of the five of us who did not co take college prep. Uh, and so he had to have advanced math and he wanted to fly. They wouldn't accept him. So he saved his money from working on a farm. That's the work they could find. Went into Boston on the train picked up the advanced math so he wouldn't be drafted in the regular, and he joined the regular uh, Army Air Force. And then on May 20th, 1942, he began his boot camp and went off and took his training for boot camp. And after the boot camp, he was um, chosen to serve as a fighter pilot. And being a fighter pilot was a very big honor. So he went to training out in Arizona, came back to Westover, Mass, Westover Air Force Base in Massachusetts, and then out into New York State, and learned to fly uh, the P-47, the Thunderbolt. America's newest fighter plane, the P-47 Thunderbolt, has left the drafting boards and is now in mass production. A four-blade propeller absorbs the terrific power of its motor. Thousands of rounds of ammunition are stored in its wings. The test pilot climbs aboard, fits his oxygen mask, and he's ready for a flight. A 
I can remember in high school when he came home after pilot's training, and then he went to uh, uh, Holliston High School, and he spoke at the assembly with his uniform and had his wings. In October of um, 1943, he married his high school sweetheart, Chucky, and, and he, uh, he, the next month he flew off uh, to England to be part of what would become the invasion force for France. He was part of the 9th Air Force, the 362nd Fighter Bomber Group, the 377th Fighter Bomber Squadron. And he was stationed in Kent, England, which is very interesting because our ancestors came from Kent, England uh, on the Mayflower from Kent, England. Like flying bullets, they streak across the sky. Thunderbolts in name, they pack thunderbolts of firepower. In February 1944, um, his first mission was to attack a place called Pays de Calais across the English Channel. The Americans' goal was to convince the Germans that they were going to attack north of Normandy. And so they, they did these runs on Pays de Calais, north of, of, of France, uh, north of Nor Normandy, so that the Germans would think that's would come and they would set up their defenses there and have all the reserves there so that when they eventually the Americans would attack uh, down in Normandy, the Germans wouldn't be prepared for it. June 6th, 1944, and the greatest armada in military history is assembled in England for an assault on Hitler's fortress Europe. For this long-awaited D-Day, the Allies have assembled 12,000 planes to protect a surface force of 4,000 ships, all under the supreme command of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who has British General Montgomery at his side. His role on that day was to be a fighter pilot escort for the C-47s. C-47s were those group of planes that flew over the Normandy beaches, those five beaches, and flew behind the lines to drop paratroopers behind the lines. And uh, so that's what he did. Um, he escorted those planes on that day. I, I just can imagine what that was like on that day. When the early morning, when they flew out to get these troopers behind the lines before the American troops landed on those beaches. The Allies have complete control of the air and cover the surface forces as Allied troops pile into the landing craft to hit the coast from Cherbourg to Le Havre. As they prepare to move in, 500 warships lay down a withering barrage. Troops move in aboard LCTs and LSTs, and it's the beginning of the end for Hitler's dreams of world conquest. Okay, fellas, roll out. We have a mission this morning. Rex in half an hour. You can expect heavy flak batteries at a place where we make landfall here at Namindagab, about a mile south of course. Now, while you're crossing the coast and when you're over aerodromes, you are advised to take evasive action. Now then, when you get to the target itself... Burley's squadron was assigned to fly a mission to destroy a railroad bridge in a place called Briouze, France. Now, Briouze, France, was this small town between Paris and, uh, and the French coast. It was an evening attack when, they, when it happened, and they, um, they flew in formation, and he was the fourth in formation. The goal was to come in single planes at a time. They would dive bomb the bridge. They would, they would let off their, their machine guns and drop their bombs on the target, the bridge, and then go up. He was fourth in line in doing that. And, and when he came down, he, he apparently went down a little bit too low, and the bomb ahead of him in that plane, in the third plane, dropped off and, and exploded, and the, and the bomb blast went up far enough that it, that it disrupted the plane that Burley was in, and Burley instinctively and training-wise naturally pulled up, and he pulled straight up into the air, and there was smoke, it says in the records, coming from his, his plane, and the, the um, Something, the, the, probably the explosion totally disoriented Burley such that when it pulled up, his plane stalled. And he went down to the left and crashed and immediately down and nosedived into a, a farmer's field and, and exploded.
My father was out mowing the lawn, and I think my sister Bev was out with her, and they saw the car. And you knew when there was a telegram at that time during the war that it wasn't good. They immediately called up to my aircraft. I had to land immediately and go in to see him. And he, he, unfortunately, he had to tell me about my brother being killed. And it was a complete shock. On my father's side, they're very quiet, and especially the men are very quiet men. And we, and both my sister and I, and the boy, we didn't talk about it too much right then, but of course it hurt so deep. But I didn't say anything. I went back to work and didn't say boo to anybody about all this. About two o'clock, my father came into work to take me home. He thought I should be home with the family. So Burley's plane crashed about a mile and a quarter just north of the bridge. It went down in this field called the Playsafe Farm, uh, a regular working farm, and it, it crashed essentially in the middle of the field. And there were a number of witnesses who, who saw the crash that night. And a cabinet maker recorded in his diary after that night that he went out to, to the field and he, and he observed that the plane was there and the plane tail was sticking out of the ground. And, but he couldn't get very close because the plane was in flames. All this aviation flew was, um, fuel was, was burning and, and so he couldn't get back. And so the next thing, first thing in the morning, he came back and two of the farmer boys from this farm came out with him and, and they, um, they were able to get close enough to, uh, to the plane and, and they, found, um, they found a bracelet that said Lieutenant B.E. Curtis on it. And so they took that bracelet and they, they found parts of Burley's body and this cabinet maker went back to his uh, cabinet making uh, building and he, he built a little casket, one foot by three foot, not very big, but big enough for what he had found. And, and he put it, Burley's remains in that casket and he buried it about a hundred feet north of where the plane crashed on a little ridge. And he put part of the, um, part of the propeller in the ground and put Lieutenant Burley B.E. Curtis uh, onto that with a, on a cross there in the ground and, and they buried him there. There were two separate groups of military forces that went in to search for my brother's remains. And the first group found them and moved them somewhere. And it's not clear in, in, in the material that's sent to the family. So when the second group came in, met together with the French people again to go to that spot where they saw him go down. The aircraft remains were there, but no body parts that they could identify. Nothing they could tie to a body. So then the military, from that point forward, through the remaining part of the war, until, until the special forces were formed later on, he was carried in a missing in action status. I used to dream that he was in the hospital someplace and then he'd come home. Well, I mean, you always have that wish, you know, especially that first year when you, you don't know. My father was desperate for information, carried on heavy correspondence with the military and, and they did their best to identify my Brothers remains and they could not do it. Their family home was in a little cul-de-sac in Holliston, Massachusetts, and they created a memorial at the end of the street that is there to this day in Burley's memory. But my father, every birthday of my brother Burley, February 24th, he always bought my mother a dozen carnation pink carnations and to honor his birthday. <laughs> I think that's it.
they had such great faith. And I remember Grandpa used to wash our kitchen floor on his knees and would sing these old hymns. And then I remember Grandpa would uh, be in the rocking chair reading his Bible for a long time. And I remember Grandma, her sweet spirit. They had every reason to be bitter. So I remember those things and now I say, they lost their son in the war. They can still sing hymns. They can still read the Bible. They can still be positive and sweet and loving to others. I say, wow, <laughs> wow, what great people. In 2012, the U.S. government sent a team to Normandy, and they uh, felt that they had recovered the crash site of Lieutenant Curtis. In 2015, History Flight, the nonprofit, got involved, and we sent Dr. Chet Walker, who is a ground specialist, and with a magnetrometer and with a History Flight cadaver dog, who specializes in recoveries up to 70 years long, he investigated the site and determined it was time to do a recovery. By then, all the above ground evidence had gone. It was now been used by a wheat field and a corn field. There was no evidence of the plane there anymore. And they began to dig. And so for three weeks, they, um, volunteers, forensic doctors, anthropologists, archaeologists, surveyor, geologists, uh, contributed 3,100 hours to find the recovery of Burley Curtis. I lay out a grid as a surveyor. They fill in the grid with the metal detectors and then we determine where the actual crater is based on the circle of materials we found. All that material that comes out of that excavation goes through screens and every piece of it is shaken uh, I run what we call a wet screen, where I have a lot of water, high pressure water. But uh, we had one young 12 year old and uh, he reaches in and he pulls out this clump and he holds it under and he holds it up in the dog tag. I told him what it was. He started dancing around the camp. That boy will never forget that instant because he just pulled part of an American hero out of the ground. They found the engine, they found numerous uh, 50 caliber bullets, they found um, insignia from the plane, they found identification numbers from the plane, they knew it was the right plane, they knew it was Burley's plane. They found um, oxygen masks, they found two uh, dog tags, uh, they found a silver bar of a first lieutenant, which he was, they found four British coins of 1940s, um, they found a pocket watch, and they found hundreds of bones that identified that this was Burley Curtis. And my sister and myself got a telephone call December 18th, 2018, from this wonderful colonel in Fort Knox, Kentucky. I think I was right there. 
and that's Europe. And uh, the colonel says, I've got the best of news for you. And I said, are you going to tell me that they recovered Burley's remains? And he said, I am. And I said, oh, my Lord, after all these years. It was as if he's coming home at last and we're going to put him beside Mama and Papa. That, you know, very deep, very emotional. Even now, I think, you know. Burley's name didn't come up in my mind that often. When I got that telephone call, and from that point forward, Almost daily, one thought would lead to another. Why? Why was he taken so young? We didn't know if we could be at the Portland airport. But finally Cheryl said, Mom, we're going to go. And I said, if you're going, I'm going to go. And then when we, they had us go over and put our hand on that urn, you know, just probably just a flood of memories. <laughs> To me, Uncle Burley was a hero who I never knew. An uncle whom my father loved so much, he named me after him. I never knew him, but I lived with him every day. But it's beautiful to know he's up there beside my parents. My sister is very there, and Emily's there, um, with my grandmother and my grandfather.
And then letters started to come. Thanks, Burley Curtis, for your courage and passion to your aircraft orders. You have saved so many lives that we are indebted to you. Know that your sacrifice is not in vain. We carry your memory in us, and you stay alive more than ever in the grateful heart of French and Normans. Thank you from the heart. What courage he had to come and risk his life away from his family. Courage to meet the challenges to defend democracy and freedom. And sincere thanks to the heroes who gave their lives for our freedom. We never forget. This is one of my favorite letters, and I'll end with this. In the papers, I discovered your story of Lieutenant Burley Edward Curtis, and I remember that day. I was 15, and I lived with my mother and my brothers and my sisters in Brieux. We were in our farmhouse with our mother, and this is what we heard. One of those planes crashed, and that was the plane of your uncle. This day is engraved in my memory forever, and I am now 90 years old. Thank you to all those young soldiers who gave their lives to save my beautiful country. My dear Lord, did my poor brother Burley lose his life at the young age of 22 years old. And I, here I am spending 33 years in the Air Force, not a day of combat action. Retired from the military, 1945, still living at the age of 100 years and a half. Could not the dear Lord have given a few of my years to my brother. I'm so grateful I've lived long enough and I have the mental human to assimilate it and analyze it and ponder it and mourn it and celebrate it. That's, that's what life is all about.